All right, um, it's nice to see a full room here, everybody. Financial services at 9 a.m. It's always really uh, enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so welcome to this morning's panel. Um, we'll be discussing the future of money and banking and labor's vision for the financial system. Um, I'm Kalina McCordoff, uh, the banking correspondent to The Guardian, and I'm joined this morning by uh, Angela Eagle, a uh, labor MP for labor MP for Wolsey and member of the Influential Treasury Select Committee. We have Fran Boyt, Executive Director uh, of Campaign Group Positive Money, and Ross Borkett, Head of Banking at the Post Office. Um, we will be joined by Tulip Sadiq, um, she's just running a bit late, um, but we will make sure that we have plenty of time, hopefully, to ask her questions when she arrive. Um, as we settle in, um, there's obviously a lot to discuss, and I kind of wanted to take a moment to sort of set the scene on the state of the UK's financial <coughs> sector. You know, at gathering just a few weeks ago, um, we had a, a bunch of banking bosses, insurance CEOs at number 11 meeting Quasi Quarteng for the first time, where he promised a so-called Big, big Bang uh, 2.0. This comment seemed to signal a return to the sudden deregulation of financial services in the 1980s, a move that he has promised would boost growth, attract new talent, and usher in a new era of prosperity for financial services. And what followed, of course, was Friday's mini-budget, which amongst its many controversies was also seen as an attempt to woo the city with policies that would <coughs> cut costs by slashing taxes, prop up the mortgage market through stamp duty cuts, and boost pay for bankers by scrapping the bonus cap, a move that was originally meant to curb the kind of risk-taking that we saw uh, in the lead-up to the financial crisis. And this is all, of course, on top of post-Brexit changes that we've seen through the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which is currently going through the committee, which I'm sure we'll get into. There's plenty to chew on. Um, but part of these uh, concerns on the bill come around government's intervention powers, if they disagree with regulations, and the reintroductions of a competitiveness objective, which means regulators would have to consider whether our rules uh, make financial services competitive on the global stage. Um, this move, some economists have warned, would be a throwback to the conditions that contributed to the financial crisis. And the Treasury yesterday confirmed that next month the Chancellor will, quote, outline regulatory reforms to ensure that the UK's financial services sector remains globally competitive. Um, so this is unsurprisingly uh, all sparked fears of a regulatory race to the bottom. But I'm hoping today we can sort of take a moment to stay calm, <laughs> pause a bit, and critically think about what the future of banking, money, and payments could look like. You know, what a system for everyone uh, would require, how that would account for financial inclusion, what that would mean for regulators and their resourcing, and how we could harness technology and developments around innovation like digital currencies to achieve that. And of course, for our labor representatives, what the party's vision for the money and banking system of the future would look like. Um, and I wanted to actually start with Fran Voigt to give us sort of an overview of the current issues that uh, positive money is focused on in the financial sector, how you think these can be addressed, particularly with uh, technology uh, and burgeoning innovation in the financial sector. Thank you so much, Tina. Thanks for that brilliant introduction, um, setting the scene of what's happening right now. So positive money's starting point for this conversation, I guess, is you know, no matter where we're from or you know, what we do for a living, we all need access to money to buy food, to, to pay our rent or mortgage and make payments. Money is an absolutely vital tool for a modern functioning economy, society, democracy. And we need a banking and investment infrastructure to get money to where we need it. But that's small and medium-sized businesses supporting our high streets, face-to-face -face banking for those who require it, and critically to help finance a green transition. But over a decade on from the financial crash, we aren't where we should be. We've got millions of households struggling with soaring costs. At the same time, we're seeing the, the city's bumper executive bonuses um, being back alongside the renewed deregulation agenda, uh, much like the one that paved the way to the crash. And, as Kalina mentioned, under the guise of international competitiveness, the city and the government are seeking to double down on finance-led economy that serves global financial markets as a priority, rather than supporting communities, businesses and the green transition. And the numbers speak for themselves. So. Um, 
Less than 5% of new banking goes to small and medium-sized businesses, of which support 60% of private sector employment. We know banks have been rapidly disappearing from the high street and taking with them crucial face-to-face -face services millions rely on. The biggest banks in the UK, Barclays and HSBC, have poured $300 billion into fossil fuels between 2016 and 2021, in direct contradiction to the Paris Agreement. We have 11 million people falling behind on their bills, and in the UK, credit card borrowing is, reaching, uh, is rising at the fastest rate in 17 years. I'm just going to ask people to maybe move over because we've still got um, audience um, members coming in, which is really great. Um, and certainly, uh, thanks to everyone. Appreciate it. It was just very excited to have so many people interested in the future of money and banking. I thought you were giving money out. Just a personal. I do get confused with the title of our campaign with positive money. Um, so, yeah, we have huge levels of household debt. Um, and I think our, our final panel member has arrived, so please let her through. <laughs> So we have really so we have really high household debt, which obviously puts uh, financial stability at risk, and obviously on top of that we're now in a recession, and thanks to the, the mini budget on Friday the pound is plummeting, meaning costs of imports will go up now. And we've also seen in the last few weeks the government obviously removing the bankers' bonus cap, rumours that they want to merge the three key city watchdogs, uh, all signals that Trust and Quartang believe an oversized, deregulated, extractive, rent-seeking city, despite the damage it's done in the past, should be a big part of the UK's economy, the UK economy's future. And it's not just civil society who have raised the alarm. The proposals have been criticised in different ways by regulators, by the former business secretary Vince Cable, and even industry heads, um, CEO of Lloyd's. Um, and as somebody put on Twitter on Friday, even the, the bankers are, are betting against the bankers' budget. Um, so they clearly don't believe in, in this agenda to an extent either. So there is also clear, clear evidence from a report we launched, we launched earlier this year called the Power of Finance, that the reforms aren't always necessarily uh, a result of broad ide ideological belief, but the result of successful lobbying um, from the sector, which has the biggest lobbying power and a disproportionately large influence over policy making. So where, where are the opportunities? Where, where do we want to change? Well, um, the first place for, for positive money is, is that the Bank of England is right now exploring a digital version of cash, which could be introduced in the UK in the next five to ten years. We see this as a really critical opportunity to bring about a safe, secure payment system with universal access and uh, obviously critically for uh, increasing financial inclusion. Um, we're partnering with the post office in part because we think the post office already play uh, a crucial role in providing face-to-face -face services, but they could provide access, be the, the front end of a digital version of cash and expand um, financial services in a similar way to to the way that Labour first introduced the first computerised payment system uh, through the Post Office Gyro Bank in, in 1968. So harnessing technology we have now um, for the modern economy, giving ordinary people access to the finan and central financial services they require. On top of this, we think it's key that the Bank of England work with the Treasury. At the moment, um, as someone said, we've got them on the brake and the accelerator at the same time, which isn't helpful. They need to work together to shift bank lending out of speculative activities and property um, markets and speculation such as driving up the cost of food when people can't afford to eat. We need credit to be going into the green transition, delivered by an ecosystem of cooperatively or publicly owned banks, which can be embedded in our communities and deliver what we need in terms of the green transition. So that's where... Um, that's where positive money is in terms of our vision. And critically right now, it is, as kind of Kalina mentioned, we've got um, a government really, <coughs> um, you know, really dedicated to this deregulation agenda. So we're, we're hoping that when we launch a, a campaign next week, which is to stop Liz Trust deregulating the city. At Tory Vodka. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, we'll, we'll have support um, you know, from, from Labour MPs in terms of our demands on, on trying to um, tackle this. And they are around ditching the international competitiveness objective, uh, giving regulators a new statutory objective to align uh, with Paris, giving regulators a responsibility to guarantee access to basic financial services, to abandon the proposals to remove the restraints on commodity markets, uh, to clamp down the unparalleled influence of big banks on politicians and policy making, to introduce processes that give civil society an equal say to the financial sector and to uh, maintain the, the cap on the bankers' bonuses. Um, there's obviously a lot to do, but really excited that this today we can start this conversation. Great, thank you. Mark. A lot to unpick on that <laughs> when we get to questions. But um, Philip, while we have you, um, our shadow city minister, wanted to turn to you to kind of give us uh, the party's vision for finance and banking. No pressure, obviously. <laughs> um, just sort of, you know, think about how you know we were talking at the beginning, obviously, about all the changes that have been um, trailed or finally announced um, by quasi quarting or I guess this push towards deregulation. Um, that seems to be, again, setting up a financial system that perhaps is not as equitable as the Labour Party would, um, would, would be hoping to. So how would you ensure a more equitable financial system? Sure. So thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me to speak here. I, we have been having a big conversation about money and cash and is there a revolution going on? And some of the conversations that we're having with um, the Treasury, it does sound like there's a major revolution, a bit like 300 years ago when the banknote first emerge and I think it needs to be a bit of a nuanced conversation about this because when I first started speaking to Treasury officials the conversation around crypto sounded like and it it was like a potential revolution in the way we exchange goods and assets and I think there was a talk about does it replace central banking um, is there digital gold is there an upending of regulation in markets and the potential surveillance of consumers and I should say, um, the conversations I had with the Treasury were interesting because the ministers kept changing one after another and every single one had a different view on crypto. Um, John Glenn took quite a nuanced view, actually, uh, and I shadowed him for a while. And we got on to Richard Fuller and now we're on to Andrew Griffith. So I'll have to see what Andrew has to say about it. But the conversation I've had with my opposite numbers, I think one of the things we've reached a conclusion on is that the realities of geopolitics... Um, corporate power and illicit finance, it should, sort of showed that cryptocurrency wasn't the utopian project that everyone initially thought it was. And a lot of people are questioning now whether crypto has a future at all. That, that's the first thing. But some of the text people I'm speaking to, the text space seems to be distinguishing between cryptocurrency itself and the technology that underpins crypto, uh, cryptocurrency. So uh, DLT and blockchain, I mean, everyone knows and what I'm talking about, but that seems to have brought about a difference from the initial conversation we had about crypto. And in my opinion, and this is what I've been saying to the Shadow Treasury team, I think blockchain technology does have advantages. I think there are benefits. I think um, it could bring productivity gains to a number of industries. And I think that in the long term, probably blockchain technology will outlive decentralized cryptocurrencies. I think it will. Um, but it sounds more like an evolution in money and banking rather than a revolution. I think it's more of an e e evolution rather than a revolution. And you talked a bit about the Bank of England, um, because we had a big briefing with them about how blockchain technology can be utilised by a central bank digital currency. Um, I thought it was a very interesting presentation um, that they had. I'm supportive of the Bank of England's work on this. I think it's ironic that the innovations that started in crypto space may strengthen, strengthen um, central banking rather than undermining it now as well. But the, the presentation we had was definitely in the preliminary stages of the Bank of England, and it sounded like they were working on it quite hard. So I think we'll see more of that coming through. But I also didn't want to just talk about cryptocurrency, because in addition to being Shadow City Minister, I'm also the MP for Hampstead and Kilburn. And there's old-fashioned cash, which is quite a big topic right now in my constituency, especially in the more deprived parts of Kilburn. I 
do welcome the provisions in the Financial Services and Markets Bill, which I'm leading on from the party, which protects cash um, and the access to cash. What's worried me about that whole thing is that it very much seems to be temporary measures. So when I'm speaking to the ministers, it sounds like they're saying, let's protect cash for now, but this is a temporary measure because soon enough we won't be using cash. And that does worry me because um, if you visit the elderly communities and a lot of the hard to reach communities in Kilburn, actually, they use money, especially now in the cost of living crisis, to budget. So we do have to ensure that we have the access to cash. In the, I don't know how many of you watched the second reading of the Financial Services and Markets Bill. <laughs> I wouldn't blame you, I wouldn't blame you, didn't. Uh, but the question that we raised constantly from our side, from the Labour benches, is will people have free access to cash? And that's, and actually the minister wouldn't answer me on that. And I even intervened at the end and said, please could the minister say whether it's free access to cash. It wasn't just from the Labour side. Some of the Conservative um, MPs stood up and asked the same questions, especially if they're in a rural constituency. I'm not in a rural constituency, but uh, there is still a question of, do we have to pay three pounds every time we try and take out five pounds, which just seems ridiculous that they are making money out of that. They haven't committed to that. That's one of the things we will be holding the government to account on, the free access to cash. So I guess um, my worries are, is it a temporary measure? Are they going to be taking this seriously? How do we ensure no one gets left behind uh, when it comes to access to cash? The narrative at the moment, it feels like inevitable decline. That's certainly the narrative I'm getting from them. Um, and then the reports from the post office is, and I've said that people are increasingly relying on notes and banknotes, but it was also the access to face-to-face -face banking services, which we've been asking about. Um, Angela, this will probably be more relevant to your constituency than to mine, because um, we have a bank, we have bank closures all the time in our, on our high street, but then there's one very close by that other people can go to. Whereas if you're in a constituency which maybe doesn't have as many bank branches, you will have to have a debate about that. So one of the things that I'm having conversations at the moment about with the Treasury is central banking hubs. Uh, it, we'll have to see how we do that because it might be a hub where all the banks will have the accesses to service. It might not be an ideal solution, but it does at least ensure that people have some access to banking services. So lots more to say, but I think um, if we see the rest of the panel, but I'm sure there'll be questions mm -hmm. on this as well. Well, then that very uh, easily leads on to Ross um, at the post office. Um, you know, thinking about banking hubs, which uh, I think we only have two at the moment, there are many promises to proliferate that, and you are involved in that project. Um, but for many people, um, as these uh, bank branches shut, um, the post office is sort of left to, to cover um, those services uh, for those left in the community. So I wanted you to sort of take us through how the post office is currently helping meet people's banking needs, what the opportunities and limitations are, and what role you see the post office playing in ensuring inclusive access to financial services? Morning, everybody. My name's Ross Bucket. Um, so yeah, I'll start start with what we do today. So across our eleven and a half thousand branches across the country, we're providing free access to cash, and that's cash deposit, deposits, and cash withdrawals. And historically, we were quite known for giving money out. You know, in the past you'd come in and you get your pension out, or people would come and get access to cash that way, but. That has changed over time. Now we are a place where not only can you get money, but you deposit. And we, in August, transacted over three billion across our counters in one month. And two billion of that is money coming in. And as banks have been closing, people are becoming more and more reliant on the post office for being able to deposit used by a significant number of people. Um, and We've seen in other countries, the likes of Sweden, who have pushed a bit quicker towards a more cashless society, they've had to start rowing back on that because they have left people behind. Um, and while I think we will see a decline, I think it will plateau. I think there will be a long, long tail of people continuing to use cash. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. And it's a worry to sort of hear that the regulations might be temporary. Um, so we, we genuinely think access to cash should be a right that we all, we all have. And therefore, we absolutely welcome the fact that the legislation is now, now coming through Parliament. We have been lobbying for a while and this needs to be sped up. We're losing about 50 bank branches a month and it has taken two and a half years to get to second reading. Um, we just need to get this in now. Um, and while it is addressing cash, I do think it is missing something around basic banking. Um, and, and I think we'll have to call bank, bank hubs in the moment. We've definitely seen in communities where they've opened 
there's a real need for this inflation <coughs> base in order to beyond cash services. What I would say is even without the legislation in, there has already been good work in advance for legislation arriving. And the cash action group that the banks formed last year has been doing some really good work in bringing the biggest banks and business societies together to collaborate. They are not well known for working well together, I should say. And I, having worked with 20 of them on a, on a daily basis, they are hard to work together as a group. They have come together and they have made some really positive strides in the last year. Um, we now have 25 banking hubs announced, um, and I'm sure there will be more announced going forward. And we are expecting <coughs> that some of the first um, neck of the next batch to be open before Christmas this year. Um, and Post Office has an important role to play in that, because we can provide our universal access to cash in communities while the bankers turn up and provide that face-to-face -face community services that in lots of places we started to lose. So looking then forward and talking a bit more around you know where for example a digital currency could play, we can see how post office already central in physical cash would also play could play a, a clear role in a digital version of that, helping access to it clearly making use of the fact that we have a physical network, we have people in the community, and thinking forward into what a physical public asset like the post office could be best used for. Um, and that's not just what we currently do in the post office, not just in other financial services, but as you look at what the government is struggling with, yeah. um, how can we collectively bring all these public assets together to do something much more community focused um, and hopefully more resilient going forward. So we're looking forward to getting into, into the debate today. Um, thank you. Thank you. And um, Angela, you sit on the Influential Treasury Select Committee, and you have the uh, honoured task of scrutinising um, all of uh, these uh, regulatory changes that are coming down the pipeline. Um, so we wanted you to perhaps give us a broad overview of what you think sort of the uh, challenges and opportunities are when it comes to the future of finance and, uh, of course, reflecting on your experience for viewing policies uh, on the committee. Okay, well, one of the um, things that um, a previous Treasury Select Committee did, which when I was on it, I think I've been on it three times over the, uh, uh, over the time that I've been in Parliament, was actually to um, force banks to say at the top of any of their machines whether the cash that you were getting out was going to be given out free or not, right up front. Because prior to the Treasury Select Committee, a previous one doing that, people would go all the way through the process and suddenly find right at the last minute that they were going to be charged. So um, if they're left to their own devices, quite a lot of the organisations that provide these services, and they're not all banks, will not tell you about the charges until the last possible minute when they have to. Um, and so I think the first thing I'd say is transparency has got to be up front. Uh, I think there's something horrible about being charged to get access to your own cash, uh, which is more horrible when the charges are a, a percentage of the resources you've got higher because you haven't got much. And of course, if the market is left to itself, uh, without some of the things that we, we, we were hearing about earlier, that's where the charges land. And people don't have a choice. And so um, what we've always got to bear in mind when we think about how um, cash might evolve and, and how uh, access to uh, your financial resources might evolve electronically or in any other way, um, you've got to think about the poorest with least choices. Those that have not connected to the systems, they don't have their Apple Pay, they don't have this, that, or the other. Um, it's not only older people, it's poorer people, it's the unbanked. And previously, the Labour government did decide to do something about financial exclusion and the unbanked. But the problem was um, that banks didn't want to do very much about it because they couldn't make any money out of them. And in fact, they didn't want to host those kinds of um, uh, bank accounts because it literally didn't, didn't make them any money at all. Um, and, and, and so what they did was they started charging um, in a way that came through quite directly in my um, casework in Wallace just over the river, for those of you who don't know where it is. It's why the sun sets. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and what happened was that those with the least would have a basic bank account which their benefits would go into. Um, but the money 
um, to take out bills uh, that, that they had uh, connected up uh, would not coincide with when the benefits went in. And so what would happen then is they'd be hit with charges that were ridiculously high um, and be in complete debt and come to me in tears. Uh, and so you can't ask people who need cash to, um, to budget so they know where they are uh, to join a system, even if it's free, which does that to them. Um, and unfortunately, left to their own devices, the financial service industry does that to them. And so um, I think that we've got to talk about um, how the financial services industry more widely serves the British people. Um, a lot of it at the moment, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a structure that can't be changed without outside intervention. It's very based on um, uh, commission, sales forces, selling people stuff um, uh, for money, financial advisors, all of that sort of thing. It, it gets more and more complex the more time goes on. The pricing structures are completely um, on a, 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 a obtuse. You have to be an expert to navigate your way around it, and you know at the same time that these are sales forces. They're not giving you facts. They're trying to sell you something. Um, and when I was pensions minister, I used to have to go to the, uh, the there's a big conference, uh, the Blue Needles Pensions Conference, where um, up in Scotland, where you, you, you find yourself in the room with probably the fund managers that have got half of the country's investment capacity in their hands. And they always complain and say, oh, it's, you know, we need more financial education. This is the cry you get the whole time from the financial services industry, which created one of the most complex, obtusely priced structures that nobody in their right mind without a degree in the prices of financial services could understand. And the fact is, we need simplified products that are, um, that are easily understandable with their prices um, upfront <coughs> and transparent. What we don't need is 50,000 different rates of, in, uh, of annual interest, all calculated differently, so when you compare them, they're completely meaningless. And they're designed to be completely meaningless um, to pull... <sighs> And so I, I think we just need a, a different way of looking at financial services. Now, this is more radical than anything Tudor's going to say, because she's on the front bench and I'm not, so I don't have to, um, I don't have to um, talk about these things. But the, the consumer rights and the consumer angle of financial services is weak, because financial services are such a strong lobbying group, and they make so much money with the system being the way it is. But what's happening is... The system services fewer and fewer people because it's so costly with all its infrastructures. So it services fewer and fewer people who have higher and higher levels of income that they want to invest and pensions that they want to invest. Um, which is why the next <coughs> pension system is so good. Because it's simplified, um, it's properly run, it's publicly accountable, and you know what the cost of it is. I'm very proud to have helped set that up when I was pensions minister. And so we need more stuff like that so that we can switch around a focus of all the way the financial services work to do that. On cash, nobody's mentioned COVID and the lockdowns and how that actually accelerated um, the, the technological change that's leading lots and lots of people to not use much cash if they've got that choice. That's very convenient for people. It's convenient for local businesses because they don't have to go to the bank with big bags of cash and do all the accounting and all of that. It happens automatically. So we are going to go to places like that the more that technology allows that to happen. And I think the important thing when we do that is to create simplified, easily accessible structures so that the convenience of that and being able to deal with that um, can be made available to more people. I agree that it's not going to be for everybody. So we have to have a residual process that, um, that, uh, that people who don't have access to that or can't remember the 50,000 PIN numbers that we're all meant to remember to deal with anything digital these days um, can, can actually do. Uh, so I think we'll be running parallel systems for a while. But what we need to understand is that we have pricing transparency um, the blockchain and the different um, 
structures that can deal with that open source banking where you can see things happening in real time um, uh, uh, could decimate um, employment in the banking industry because you don't need all that structures and the layers of different people to, to handle the transfer of cash. Um, but if that does happen, that technological change has got to lead to easier access to banking. Uh, and some of the money that's currently used up in structures needs to be um, made available to uh, ensure that this stuff is, uh, is widely disseminated and everybody can have access to it. So that's just a little bit of um, my comments on these things. I think there's a huge issue about the financial services stuff and the changes. The Treasury Committee is now going to have to be, have be a sifting committee to look at all the stuff that the EU used to look at. It's highly technical. Nobody will ever notice we're doing it. Um, we already have two meetings a week. It's very, very difficult to uh, get down to the detail of some of this uh, tech, techie stuff. But the techie stuff is where the devil is. And if you get it wrong, you can end up where we were in 2008. And so I would be an alarmed at someone who wanted to deregulate a system like our current Chancellor does. Um, so soon after the banking crash, before there's really <coughs> proper reform. We've had Basel and, and, and the different things to make banks safe, but we've got the non-banking shadow banking system now, which is much more of a threat than it was when banks were allowed to behave like shadow banks are now behaving, or hedge funds, I hesitate to use that phrase, after the shorting scandals. Um, but what, what we know is that they are there to make money. They don't have a moral view of it. And they will do whatever you let them do, if it's profitable. Uh, and, and that has potential consequences for the financial system because it's so connected. And it's going to be more connected and faster because of the technological change. And that means that the regulators have got to be much more proactive. And there's a capacity issue with reg we're regulators across the world, not only central banks, but the FCA type regulators, the people that regulate insurance and other financial products. Um, and, you know, non-fungible tokens, any sort of crypto we get, is going to add another layer to that and potentially more um, uh, sort of volatility if we don't get a handle on it. So these are big, huge issues. Um, that have the potential to cause real problems if they go wrong, as we've seen before. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we've got to make certain that those who are regulating, not only central banks, try to keep ahead and on top of the innovation that's going on. Um, and I think if you look at Nest, which is a publicly provided um, pension fund, which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as more people go into it, that is going to be able to shape the market in future. And you need the presence of things like that that are accountable, that gather funds, that are doing it in the public interest not to make a profit in some of these other markets, I think, um, to ensure that um, you get the presence of, of, of decency and not just rapid money making and down to consequences. But enough about the chance. <laughs> So I've um, definitely touched on quite a broad range of topics, as is financial services. This is my um, my issue every day. There's too much to discuss. Um, but there's one thing um, I kind of feel is pulling through this, um, which again is this sort of financial inclusion line. I was really interested in um, to what you said about sort of, you know, we were very excited about digital currencies, um, the prospect of what that could mean. Um, but really it's about the infrastructure. Now, we talked about COVID kind of uh, accelerating this move towards sort of a more cashless, uh, maybe card-based system, but it almost feels like we're about to head into a test of that. If we're going to be hitting sort of an energy crisis that challenges our ability to keep the lights on, for our technology to keep working, I feel like cash continues to be uh, key or king to some people. Um, I'm just wondering if the current conditions um, anyone feels in terms of sort of energy security are perhaps going to give us an opportunity to revive concerns about cash use beyond sort of just sort of um, 
people who are unbanked on a financial inclusion level, but this is really going to be something that we talk about sort of every day in order for our economy to continue working. I don't know if Brian wants to perhaps pick up on that first. Sure, I can pick up on a few things. I guess, yeah, I mean, absolutely protecting access to cash is absolutely fundamental, as you said, not just for now, but for the future. Um, and you know, I could talk about some of the issues that happened in COVID. I mean, there's a lot of evidence to say it was, it's, you know, there's absolutely, um, it's, it wasn't worse for transmitting COVID, like hard was worse, if anything. Um, but obviously there are lots of benefits, as you mentioned, to small businesses. We need to protect cash. And alongside that, obviously, we think we need a digital cash version, which, which the banking was already researching. And that can't replace cash for lots of reasons, but particularly about inclusion, the physicality and the abacus effect of cash is crucial and you can't count uh, kind of digits. Um, but you know, just drawing on what Angela was talking about, Nest, like the, what we see is, is the potential for a digital cash is that it, it is a cornerstone of a public payment system. So we actually build a payment system in the public interest, which we don't have. Like, we're totally reliant on our biggest banks for our payment system. And as I said at the beginning, we all need to make payments. And that's kind of separate from what the complexity of what banks do in terms of investment and shadow banking. It is kind of a utility, like turning the water on, turning the lights on. So by having a kind of public payment system, which has the interests of, of all of us, of the many of, of those very basic payments and financial services, then we start to shift the whole system because we have that protection. At the moment, we have very concentrated banking sector. The five biggest banks have, I think, 60 or 70% of total banking assets. If one of them goes down, they bring the payment system to a collapse. And you know, so therefore, they're too big to help. We can't let the payment system grind to a halt. But actually having a public payment system that's secure, that's safe, that's universally accessible, that's separate from big banks, then we actually start building a more secure, more stable financial system that can work for, um, for many and actually have the kind of boring side of, of banking and making payments. <coughs> and obviously, yeah, that doesn't negate all of the conversation around cash and how critical that is <coughs> to the future of, of financial inclusion. Yeah. Anyone else want to pick up on that? Can I just come back on some of the, the points around COVID, actually? You, you're right, we saw, we saw a decline in the use of cash <coughs> in, in the sort of the worst of it. And there was the concern about transmission. Um, but our, we've seen quite the opposite now. We're, 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 we're doing more cash over our counter now than we were before COVID. Um, and I think there's a few things playing out. One is, I think as energy prices are going up, we are seeing people turn back to cash to help budget. It is far easier for many people to be able to see in front of them and budget that way. And we see in particular, we do build payments over the counter as well, especially for prepaid energy customers. Um, we see people come in and top up a few pounds at a time, whatever they can afford to, to keep eating on. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that as we go into this winter, where people choose to operate in cash and they choose to pay when they can um, um, and, and do what they can on that. From a business perspective, though, we've also <coughs> seen businesses go the other way and get rid of their card yeah. machines and go back to cash because the merchant fees are so high that it is not making sense. It is really hard on the high street right now, and the cut that is taken by having to deal in card um, is, is, is too much for some people, and they're moving back to cash. They can come and bank it at the local post office, um, and actually that is a cheaper way of operating than, than going the other way and going cash off. <coughs> Yeah, just, I guess, on a very basic level, when I've spoken to constituents, it feels like this, I mean, as some of them have said to me, the main reason I want to use cash and have access to it is because it's easier to budget. And it's a very simple thing to say, but maybe some people are not digitally so savvy and they can't go online and make a record of how much money they have and how much they're spending. And it sort of struck me because I'm so used to having my phone all the time and writing things and access to online banking is so easy for me. It's not the case for everyone. I think we can't leave those people behind. But um, just to make another point on the demand for a digital currency, I think if the demand does increase, then I think this idea of a central bank digital currency will strengthen, I think, to protect the integrity of the Bank of England. And I think at that point, there's definitely a consideration that large parts of the population will not be able to use that or access that and I think the idea of financial exclusion has to be a top priority and we've got to consider it if we do start considering the central bank digital currency and the other thing just as an aside is that 
there will be some questions about privacy as well and how much access they have to the amount of financial transactions that you make if you if there is a digital currency. But overall, just to just to add to what you're saying about financial exclusion, it's the simple things that we possibly wouldn't consider because we're so comfortable with online banking. And it strikes me actually every time I do an advice surgery how many people bring it up. So it is a real consideration mm -hmm. and a real worry. I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate on some things coming through on the financial services um, markets bill, which is um, this uh, <coughs> prospect of government having intervention powers with regulators. Now, um, obviously, I think there, there is a warranted concern about this, but when it comes to things like access to cash, the way we want to structure the financial system, what we want regulators to do in order to keep up with new innovations that they just seem to potentially be lagging behind on, I'm wondering if our, our, our labor uh, panelists might be able to weigh in on um, the opportunities you see any of these interventionist powers coming down the track. I worry about them. And, um, uh, and I did say uh, in, the, in the second reading that the, the, there are some pretty draconian Henry VIII powers in this bill uh, for the government. That's a, 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 a parliamentary technical term for the government being able to just write the law and not even bring it into parliament. Um, and so there's Henry VIII powers, and there are also powers to override the regulator. Um, and I don't think you can do that without having proper accountability. You either have an independent regulator or don't. I mean, you know, quasi Quatang is going to impose himself upon the government of the Bank of England twice a week, according to <laughs> and what he said. What does that do about the independence of the Bank of England, apart from wasting the government's time? Um, so I, I think that we've got to watch this very, very, very carefully. Um, uh, and I don't think that the, the powers in the bill as it's written at the moment are very, very wide-ranging to allow the government to do what it likes without even telling Parliament. So that's got to change. Mm -hmm. um, regulators will regulate uh, according to the structures that the government puts in for them to do so. Uh, and you need to trust them to do that. Um, and there has to be openness about how that is, you know, the values that, and, and the aims of the regulation. Um, and that has to be done by a um, parliamentary discussion and, and, and the, the government um, being upfront about what its aims are. If it's just allowed to write the law itself when it feels like it, which is what the bill allows them to do at the moment, I, I worry very much about what might happen with that, given the lobbying powers of some of the more... Um, there, are, there are some ends of the industry, and I'm not making a, a generic point here uh, about all parts of the industry, but there are some <coughs> ends, you know, the, the shadow banking at the, the end of the industries, the financial services industry, that have huge amounts of money I might even say that they fund quite large parts of the Tory party. Um, and they're not, you know, that if they can just go to the government and get stuff written without anyone having to notice it, that is a serious, serious problem. And it presents a, a, a problem of, of insider dealing and, and corruption at the, at the worst aspect. And so we've got to be very careful about allowing that to happen. Now, I don't think John Glenn wanted that to happen. He's a perfectly decent man. Um, but the temptations inherent in the way the bill is written at the moment, I don't think are good. So I uh, agree with Angela in that I'm very worried about the intervention powers. Uh, just to make it clear, it wasn't in the preliminary discussions of the bill. So when we first sat and talked about it, and then just before the second reading, I got a text saying uh, this snuck in the intervention powers, which, which I think in itself shows that they knew we would have objected in the initial stages if they had talked about it. Um, I'm very worried about the intervention powers. I think it will compromise the independence of the regulators. I think it will affect the independence of the FCA. I also think um, it's very worrying that they haven't actually published the details, because I think it's always a bit dodgy when you announce something like an intervention power, don't announce the details, and then when I pushed the minister as well uh, during, the, during the debate, he said it hasn't been published yet, and that's always a red flag for me. And I also worry about it affecting the competitiveness of our financial services generally. I worry about the fact that it may impact the fact that we are a key financial hub outside the EU. And uh, I, I don't think it's a good thing. It's, I mean, you can hear it by concerns about it already. 
I'll wait to see what the full details are before I make a final judgment, but we will probably, from the Labour Party, oppose the intervention powers because we think it undermines the regulators. Um, I wanted to give everyone sort of two to oh, I don't have to, but yeah, just very briefly. I mean, yeah, just that we, I mean, very much good. This is, you know, making steps towards finan the financial sector writing its own rules, potentially. That's kind of a bit of the fun. Potentially. Yeah, it's exactly. all of them. Yeah. But, uh, but we have to uh, recognise that they are the, by far the big biggest lobbying industry, parts of them uh, in the country. You know, they have the most meetings with the Treasury. Um, Every chance of the last 40 years has gone on to financial sector job. Uh, yeah, job. 50, uh, has some financial sector connection. Financial sector connection. Uh, we've got. <laughs> <laughs> you can read our report, Angela. There's, there's a, yeah, evidence that they, they have had a connection to the, the financial sector. It has such a huge. Um, it, it's so connected to our. our um, our policy making and it, it's a big issue the the, the revolving door the, the lobbying influence um, and I think the other point around the calling powers is like you know if you know, obviously they're I think they're just generally very dangerous but your kind of point around financial inclusion clean is like if we want to um, kind of put that further we need to just give the regulators the role of our responsibility yeah the financial conduct authority has no responsibility for being concerned about financial inclusion. And the way that the you know, regulators are going is that they just have this complex, oversized sector that's kind of like a ticking bomb to an extent because of its instability to regulate. So they kind of move towards being risk managers and they don't really have time or head, you know, they don't really think about the fact that the industry isn't providing the basic services we need. So you have to, as Angela said, you have to give them the responsibility to do that. Um, by adding that to their um, objectives. Uh, yeah, so that's something that we're calling for with a whole um, group of civil society organisations as part of this bill, um, among, among other things. I just want to add that. All right, so we're going to take just a two minute break for people to talk to each other about what we've just heard. Um, that sort of crystallize your thoughts for our question and answer period. We'll be sort of uh, coming back out about what's happening. Because you know, as we've talked about already, this complexity behind which the financial sector operates means that people feel totally disempowered to talk about it. Um, and we, you know, we really are heading in the wrong direction on fraud, on, on deregulation, and um, on a number of issues which will undermine the economy's stability. I just very quickly want to add into that point on, on crypto, because I mean, we were looking into the fact that um, you know, Gibraltar was set to open up one of the first exchange um, exchanges for cryptocurrency, and we were talking to someone at the who used to work at the DOJ, and they were saying, "Look, um, the the first mover on something uh, like cryptocurrency that's going to be sort of publicly traded um, would would probably result in international sanctions." And I think it, it requires sort of a, yeah, a very, like you said, sort of very um, careful steps in terms of how we um, explore those you know opportunities versus risks. And um, let's go back to questions. Hi, my Barnes, uh, Labour councillor from Calderwell. Um, I just want to take one issue with your panel before I ask the question. I'm not concerned about where the chancellors go to, I'm more concerned about where they've come from. When you look at where the last ch the last series of chancellors have come from, actually maybe that you can then look at some of the mini budget on Fridays uh, and you look at why those are in. So I think I think it's where they've come from that is more of a concern than where they go into. Um, cryptocurrency all this lot, hey look, what does the public want? You know, yeah. yeah, how many times, you know, I'm a, I'm a councillor, I can't think of anybody who's ever spoke to me about cryptocurrency. I work in a building society as well. Nobody in a building society, apart from one fraud, is who's ever talked about crypto. Unfortunately, we stopped them sending all of their money out to some bank in Kazakhstan. Because when you actually spoke to them about it, they thought they were buying a commodity, they thought they were buying a product. They thought we like gold or silver and what have you. Why do we not stop talking about what people want? Cash, absolutely. We see massive increase in cash for the very reasons we've all gone through but it's also people feel safe with cash mm. they feel safe they feel secure with cash so, um, uh, hi i'm navan from brunswick um uh, banks like hsbc are doing quite a lot to support underbanked and unbanked uh, vulnerable people in our society such as those from homelessness communities what can the future Labour government do to support banks like HSBC to help those 
help those homelessness, home, homeless people to open bank accounts and be part of our financial community. And one more, uh, well, with that, thanks very much, um, Diane Green, other councillor from North Wales, looking at the Gallic. We've been left with no banks. Thank goodness for the post office. Um, if you don't know Abergelly, it's a rural area. We've got lots of farmers who mainly deal in cash. We've got lots of retired people who are not tax savvy, and they do like to go to use the counters. Um, about 10 years ago, we started closing the banks. I had this bonkers idea. I think I woke up and thought, why don't we have a general bank? Why has this not happened? General bank run by the co-op, the Labour Party, and the post office. So it could be used as a hub with low <coughs> interest rates, sorry, low commission rates, but it gives people security of their money and it gives them access and a, and a decent counter, counter service. So I'm, I was thrilled to bits to hear, to hear Tula talking about the hubs that are going to be growing. And um, keep going, please, with the post office. It's our lifeline in uh, Bagelli. Thank you. So not a question, just a remark. Right, and those are three that we'll, we'll get started with and we'll try to get one more round in. Um, does anyone want to start with any of those in particular? Um, well, I think, that, uh, the, you know, HSBC and all the work they're doing good. Um, we need to make sure we don't fall into the same trap that we fell into uh, when we last did this. And I explained a little bit of what, what some of, of, of how that worked out in practice for some people. Um, so there's an issue of charges and managing um, uh, bank accounts that have, have got very small amounts of money in them and the timing of when benefits come in uh, or fixed um, payments come in and, and, and banks you know, basically making money by, by making charges uh, against people. And, and, you know, the people that I met that had suffered from that were in a debt that they couldn't understand how they'd run up, um, really frightened about it, and, you know, wouldn't have touched a basic bank account again with a barge pole if they were ever given another chance. So, you know, um, it's a question of the practicalities of how this stuff works. And does anyone want to talk about sort of a public bank option? Labor. I mean, what, just just in response to your question, um, we haven't entirely set out every detail of our manifesto, but the things I can tell you for sure is that we will add, um, protect free access to cash and we will be protecting in-person banking hubs. And whereas we don't know the full details of that, there's no doubt that there's, we're exploring the solutions of is it a, as you say, everyone under one roof sort of banking hub or is it a kiosk or what is it? But we're very aware of what you're saying and there's no doubt about it. We can't live in a cashless society and we can't just have temporary measures. I just want to say something, by the way, you know, you said, um, I think you said that it was a bit concerning that we were talking, the government was talking about temporary measures. They haven't actually said temporary measures. But the narrative around it and the conversations we are having sound very temporary to me. But in the actual bill, it doesn't say temporary. I just wanted to correct that unless I got into trouble. <laughs> and I'll just pick up quickly on what you said. I agree with you. The conversations we have are about cash um, and how do we pay for things and the cost of um, food and commodities. So how do I feed my children? But I, I honestly think we can't ignore the cryptocurrency regulations. The government has included the regulation of stable coins, which is one aspect of it in the financial services and markets bill coming up. But I think it's something we can't ignore because of the illicit finance I outlined, but also because of the amount of scam and fraud. At least if there's some regulation and some sort of um, legislation around it, there'll be less scam and fraud. I don't think it's a number one priority in financial services, but I really think the government needs to get ahead of the game just to protect people from the scam and fraud that's happening. Um, on any sort of points? Um... Yeah, I mean, um, to your point, really, I think um, we obviously play that big role today in, in, in cash and providing that within communities. Mm. Absolutely, it could be something, I think, when we start talking about central bank digital currency, you could see how the post office with Bank of England could, in partnership, do something more there. So I think there's opportunities to explore it. It's you know it's a longer term vision that I think is worth worth debate. Maybe just picking up on that, I mean I think kind of key to all those questions is, is trust, right? So we poll the public a lot and there's very little trust in banks, the big banks, very little trust in the city working in the public interest. So that's why we really think we need this move towards some kind of public payments infrastructure that is separate that's in the public interest that people will trust and there's a big challenge to that being built in a way that the public will use and trust so thinking about how the bank of england can work with the treasury and dwp to make this a place where everyone access can access 
payments, you know, face to face as well as uh, you know online, I think is critical to building trust and actually having that conversation about what people need, which is separate from kind of the city and what's going on there. And and that's why you know we do see this opportunity for the post office um, being a key player in that, but also not to negate the conversation that we need around the other kind of banks we need, the community banks, cooperatively owned, publicly owned, that can actually also provide the finance we need for like lending, for these businesses, for the green transition. So we kind of see these two areas as the key uh, conversations we need to be having, and obviously we need to be thinking about trust because people don't trust finance right now. Um, unfortunately, we have come to the end of time, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, it's been very interesting, especially you know having opened up thinking about all of the sort of deregulation moves um, taking part sort of at high levels of the city, and we really spent a lot of time focusing on the consumer issue. So um, let's see whether that comes up uh, as the months go on with the current government. Yeah, before, to... before we close, though, can I ask the people here on behalf of the post? I'm Hugh Davis from the Communication Workers Union. How many of you actually use post office banking? So most of it you've done. Um, so on this issue, we're probably going alongside what the post office did. Please use the post office. Thank you for the final comment. Thank you. Um, just wanted to thank our panelists, uh, Brian, Angela, Ross, and Tulip, um, and thank you all for coming. It's been a great turnout.